joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good. I'm glad that you're here to talk to us a little bit about your work, mm -hmm. um, some of the projects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in a project that you've done called Statistical Inference for Everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but first, I want to ask you a little bit about how you got involved teaching and what your background is. So uh, um, I have a background in physics. I have a uh, um, bachelor's in physics from Wesleyan University in Connecticut and then a PhD from Brown University. At Brown, I did work in computational neuroscience, so looking at how to understand how the brain works, learning and memory from um, computational models of neurons. And, uh, and this is within the physics department, so we're approaching it differently than, say, a biologist would. At Brown, as part of your physics degree, you are uh, responsible for TAing some of the physics labs. And even at that time, I was interested in teaching, um, and I would look for ways to kind of connect to the students and help them with various topics. And I wrote these uh, homemade guides for um, various topics, which are essentially supplemental to whatever the textbook was to uh, go over anything that was particularly confusing for them. And I realized I still have those you know, on my website. You can always get, you can go back to you know, the 90s and find my, my, uh, <laughs> these homemade guides I wrote when I was a graduate student. That's pretty cool. Are they, do you think that they're still applicable to some of the things yeah, that you teach today? I, I actually, yeah, I have actually used some of them. Uh, like one of the ones I know on uh, circuits I, I, I've used uh, for my class just last year. I started at Bryant uh, in 2000. And so I teach here, I teach physics, I teach astronomy, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, computational neuroscience. I've taught uh, uh, dynamical systems and machine learning. So a lot of different things. But I guess the overall theme of what I teach is kind of quantitative methods and kind of way to, 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 to think in, in science. Tell me a little bit more about the statistics classes that you're teaching. All right. Well, actually, I don't teach don't any of the statistics okay, classes. This here is we one go. thing that's kind of interesting about the, yep. uh, the project that you mentioned, the uh, Statistical Inference for Everyone. So that was a, a textbook that um, I wrote, in a sense, to prove a point. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's kind of an odd motivation, perhaps. But uh, uh, so there are two schools of thought about statistical inference. One is, is what is traditionally called frequentist or orthodox, and the other, which is traditionally called uh, Bayesian. I found over, over time that the Bayesian approach seemed to me to be the, the correct one. And it occupies a kind of a strange position in, in mathematics or statistics in that none of the introductory classes use that approach. So even though you can show that most of the successes in statistical inference of the past decade, you know, things like use of you know, automatic driving cars to the forecast for political um, uh, elections, they all use Bayesian methods, and yet none of the introductory classes use, use them. And so when I approached mathematics professors, and I, and I taught some of this probability theory in physics class, I've definitely you know, taught it in machine learning class, and, and so I, I taught pieces of these things, but just not as a standalone statistics class. And and so when I approached that professors and math professors about, about this, there seems to be a historical kind of various reasons why this is you know, not typically done, and there are a number of uh, reasons given. Uh, so I just decided, you know what, I'm going to write my own textbook to kind of show how it could be done. I mean, there may be better ways to do it, or other people could you know, do it, whatever, but just as a proof of concept to say, you know, here's how we could do an introductory statistics class from a Bayesian point of view, and, and, and I would you know, write a textbook to kind of show how that would be done. And it also helped to kind of clear my head about kind of all the ideas and, and make that, that kind of clear myself by kind of giving a, a clear progression and what would the logic of a class like that be. So one of the things that's unique about statistical inference for everybody, or for everyone, mm -hmm. right, is that it's an open educational yes. resource. Could you tell me a little bit about why you decided to make an open educational resource? I wanted to make sure that the barrier to entry for anyone was as low as possible. And then I was also motivated by a few other open educational resources that showed me the value of making a product and kind of putting it out there so that you know, anyone can have access to it. Were there any challenges that you faced when you were making this book? I mean, I would say just the, the, the normal uh, challenges of writing. If you're doing the traditional publishing route, you may have uh, editors or a publisher kind of breathing down your neck on uh, deadlines. You have a lot of control, yeah. but then again, you have control. 
Could you tell us a little bit about how this textbook or how you think this textbook has impacted your students? One of the things that, that happens is, is a, a problem might come out in, say, physics lab when we're doing, and again, a question will, uh, will come up like, you know, how many data points do I need to, to, to take? Or, you know, how do I do this particular analysis that might not be in the book, right? So then I can add it to the book right then and there and then have an update. And so the students have access essentially to this kind of moving, uh, growing target of, of this of this book that that then adjusts based on 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 what problems we're we're having to do and also just to see that process any textbook is incomplete and here's how we can fix it or make it more complete or at least more relevant to this particular case. What would you say to your colleagues who are interested in making this kind of resource? So there's not much of a downside to trying something out. Start small, like you know, do do little things, or maybe contribute to one of the other open uh, education you know, resources, things like OpenStax or, or some other uh, uh, you know, textbook series. You said that some of your colleagues might be a little hesitant to try. Do yes. you have any idea why? Or? I think the biggest issue is a matter of quality or perceived quality. There's often a thought that the open uh, access materials are of a lower quality than those that go to a traditional publisher. And I would say there's probably a lot more variation I um, mean that there there is some stuff that's that's not really you know that high quality, but there's some stuff that's very high quality, and it takes some effort to kind of sift through. And occasionally, I've done experiments. So, for instance, in astronomy, there were two that seemed to come out. So, for the students, because there's no cost for them, I, I presented them with both, and then I gave readings for a few weeks with both of them, and then after a few weeks, asked them which one do you prefer and why. Computer programs is another place where you have kind of open source, which is a, the same philosophy, really. So I want to transition a little bit into um, questions that are a bit more personal, right? So sure. what has been the most enjoyable aspect of working on a project like this for you? Um, for me, I think coming up with interesting examples that, are, that, that really highlight a particular topic but are entertaining. So for example, in the uh, statistics book, I have an example with a psychic octopus. There was Paul, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, guess I should say, allegedly psychic octopus. <laughs> that That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so it was Paul the octopus, he was a German octopus who predicted World Cup matches. Out of his 14 predictions, he got 12 right, which is phenomenal for if you think that the process is totally random. And so I used the student to introduce the idea of probability of rare events and also multiple hypotheses. So, you know, we're not just left with, say, you know, a randomly choosing octopus and a psychic <laughs> octopus, right? You know, there might be other things going on. I mean, and, and so those sorts of examples are both kind of entertaining, which makes them memorable, but it also really highlights particular problems in, in, in can you give an example of a time that you've failed and maybe used that failure to kind of propel you forward? Junior year, applying to grad school, I applied to about six different In hindsight, did a terrible job with the applications <laughs> because I was like, oh. you know, working on my thesis, I was doing a bunch of classes, too busy. I didn't get in any. That was pretty demoralizing, actually. My, uh, my advisor set me up with a job to go after, after uh, uh, the summer. Just before I was supposed to go, that lab had a major accident. And I had to do temp work you know, in the summer in my you know, hometown for, for a while. And, and so, so you know, things were not, didn't seem to be going very well. But the, the, the year off got me one, I, could kind of, uh, I found that I was, did want to go back to school. Right? So, it wasn't, so it wasn't just doing it just because. And so I was studying more and, and things like that. But it gave me the time to like you know, um, to write better essays, to do a much more thorough job on my applications, to way ahead of time ask for letters of recommendation so then, so then those letters were much better because they weren't rushed, they weren't forced or anything like that. And the second time around, I pretty much got in everywhere, including Brown, which is where I, where I went. So you know, that was one of those cases where the initial failure kind of put me in a position where I had to kind of reevaluate, but it gave me the space in order to deal with like, okay, now what do I need to do to succeed? Even when it looks bleak, there's you know always opportunities and always to, to, to look for that and take and take advantage of. I mean, if 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 you've lost an opportunity, that provides you some time to find another one, right? You know, or to or to reevaluate. I mean, it could have been the case that having not gotten in anywhere. After a while, I've been like, yo, you know what? I don't really need to go back to school for this, or I could go back to school for something else, but it gives you the, the, the space to, to, to do that. Is there any kind of advice that you think students should ignore? 
Um, I would say ignore anything that tells them that they're going to fail or that something you know, you know, might not work. Hey, it's true. Something might not work, but try it anyway. You know, but if you, you know, don't do it, then you'll never really know. Do you have any unusual habits or absurd things that you like to do? I am a big Babylon 5 fan. What is Babylon so, 5? Okay. So I was going to say that because a lot of people will not know what that reference is. So Babylon 5 is a science fiction show from the 1990s. It ran from about 1993. To I would say that that show paved the way for many shows in the future, including Game of Thrones. Which at the time that Babylon 5 aired, uh, producers pretty much thought that audiences were incapable of following a story for more than three episodes. Babylon 5 was the first TV series that had a five-year planned story arc. So it was planned from the beginning to go five years like a novel and have like a, a climax somewhere around you know season four and and and, and finish in, in in season five and and so there are things in season one that that um, um, refer to seasons later on and it's a cumulative story. I've seen that show many many times and now that I really don't watch TV much, I took the audio off of the uh, the copies I have so I can listen to it in the car like an audio book. That's a little unusual, perhaps a little obsessive, but uh, it really <laughs> is a very good show. What do you do when you're feeling unfocused? Um, when I'm feeling unfocused, I would go back to basics. So most of the time when I feel like I'm un unfocused is because I'm distracted by stuff. You know, delete stuff off of phones, you know, take all social media off. Uh, I usually give up all social media within, like, you know, for, for a month or so uh, in the spring anyway. You know, I block it on my laptop, I, you know, do that sort of thing. Go back to basics, analog, write things down by hand, uh, that, that kind of stuff. I find that helps me kind of you know, make it a little bit more concrete, but also helps me kind of really focus on what I, what I kind of need to do at that point in, in my life. My organizer is a bullet journal, and so it's an actual physical journal that I write, you know, in, in pen and... and so and I find that helps helps me kind of focus. And so there's something a little bit more concrete there. It also has a built-in almost kind of prioritization. With bullet journaling, you know, once you kind of fill up a journal, you copy all the stuff to another one, right? And if you find yourself copying something multiple times that you've been procrastinating, you start evaluating, do I really need to do this? Am I procrastinating it because it's just procrastination or because it's like it really doesn't need to be done? And, and so you kind of have this built-in, you, know, you know, method of, of kind of reevaluation. Brian, thanks for chatting with us today about your work and about some of the projects that you have going on in the future and about zombies <laughs> and uh, about psychedelic, psychic, uh, psychic octopi. Yes, yeah, yeah. psychic yeah. octopi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Incredible. Um, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.